Thank you all for coming. And uh, I'm really excited to offer this inaugural innovative teaching strategies brown bag series. The, the, the purpose of this is to promote engaged conversation among our faculty about the teaching strategies and the innovative methods of delivery. I would like to thank the members of the arts and science teams, faculty advisory council, and particularly Dr. Gardner, Dr. Amy Sanford, Dr. Winford, who are organized and promoted this event. And uh, today, this event is going to be facilitated by our own professor, Dr. Patricia Smith. And we are, and Amy is going to introduce Dr. Smith. And we are really fortunate to have someone like Dr. Smith on our faculty. And uh, thank you, and uh, Amy. All right, so it's my pleasure to get to introduce uh, Dr. Patricia Smith. Um, as most of you probably know, she's a full professor in the Department of English. And uh, this summer will mark her 10th year at Clayton State. Time flies, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, she has a, a, a wide-ranging history of teaching. Um, she taught uh, high school, um, ninth and 10th grade for five years, as well as senior comp. And uh, she also uh, taught at Boston University, where she also received her master's in, curric uh, her master's in English with sub areas in reading and writing. Well, master's at George Mason University. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm all sorry. That's We're collaborating. Yeah. Right, 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 she right. did get her doctorate at Boston University yeah. in uh, curriculum and teaching English education. And um, she taught at Boston University and at Fitchburg State. Um, and currently, she heads up our singlish, singlish, <laughs> our secondary English education program, and is interim direct, uh, director of the first year writing program, and teaches um, first year writing, American literature one, advanced grammar, methods of teaching, writing methods of teaching literature. And I can tell you, as someone who goes out and observes those students, that. Um, when they leave her class, they are prepared to go out into the world of teaching. Um, she'll probably tell you this, but her, her philosophy of teaching is one of a constructivist, and her quote is, it's all about making meaning through collaboration. And um, I think that kind of reflects who she is, um, the value she places on sharing ideas and working within a community. And if you've ever worked with her on a committee or been her mentee, you know that's true. Uh, she's one of the most professional, thoughtful, knowledgeable educators I've ever worked with, and I've been working with educators for 27 years. And uh, she's had the steadiness about her and all that she does, especially in the classroom, because she just has such extensive knowledge in um, content and research and research-based uh, pedagogical content knowledge. And um, so I'd like to introduce my colleague, mentor, and my friend, Dr. Trisha Smith. I welcome you all here today. Uh, when I was first approached about presenting here, I chose the first one because I thought, well, I'm going to be working on a textbook for connections in first year writing because I'm that, you're it, because you've got that on your resume, that line item. So I thought it would be best case scenario to begin here. And I'm honored to be a part of this today, a part of the uh, learning experience. Please know that this is going to be a conversation. We need to talk to one another. We're, we're talking about collaboration in the classroom. We need to hear what it is that you do as well. And I have some slides. I'll be adding, of course, information to those slides. Uh, but basically, they're set up so that we walk through the process today. Um, we're talking about collaborative learning, but we're talking about a subgroup of collaborative learning, which is flexible grouping. For those of you who are interested in differentiating in your classroom, that idea that all learners need that opportunity to learn and to access materials before they leave your classroom, then we're looking at that idea of using flexible grouping. Uh, and I will tell you that back in the day when I taught high school English, I wasn't really wedded to this idea of flexible grouping. It hadn't come out yet. 
All it was was collaborative learning. It was new. I'm dating myself, really dating myself, but collaboration was Oh my gosh, it's like those collaborative schools where there are no walls. And I got into a lot of trouble. I was teaching at a private school at first. Hi. I was teaching at a private school and um, the Spanish teacher next door was banging on the wall every day because I use collaboration in the classroom. I, ha was, uh, I had just finished my degree in liberal studies with uh, a focus in philosophy and literature, minors in philosophy and literature, and so I was wedded to Vygotsky, Lev Vygotsky, and um, one of the quotes from Lev Vygotsky that I will always remember is that language is the main tool that promotes thinking, develops reasoning, and supports cultural activities like reading and writing. It promotes literacy across the curriculum, uh, it is discussion with purpose. So because I was true to what I had studied, uh, Lev Vygotsky became my guiding tool. And so because of that, I was always down in the principal's office as a teacher, and my department chair would sit and say, you know, they're learning in her classroom, but he would say, when I walk by, it's really noisy, and the Spanish teacher, sorry, <laughs> is complaining all the time. Remember, we're talking mm, a little bit of a time back. So uh, that's when I decided that I needed to learn a little bit more about my craft. And I went on for my master's degree in English uh, with the focus on the teaching um, of literature and teaching of writing. Um, and so uh, I had always experienced, when I went to George Mason University, this idea that we collaborated uh, and that we discussed. And there wasn't a class uh, time that went by, even in my grammar classes, because we'd spend three weeks on the transitive verb alone, that we had discussions. And uh, they were very good discussions, and I learned a lot. Uh, and then, um, let me, let me click this, I guess. I don't have a clicker with me, but I'm just going to, you know, because there aren't that many slides. Here's the scenario, okay? I'm at Boston University, and I'm in my first, uh, maybe first or second semester, and I'm in the first of one of my three statistics courses. Now, mind you, I'm trying to get a degree in curriculum and teaching English education. I have a philosophy and English background. I don't have a statistics background. Sorry, Winifred, where are you? Right. <laughs> we are actually best buddies. Can you imagine these two broad ranges, you know, from here to here? Um, no, it won't go on the other. But you have the slides on your, um, you have this. No, leave it on. Yeah, yeah, you have the slides here. So here I am, and it's all lecture. There is a TA who stands behind the professor and comes up from time to time and says, you okay? You okay? You okay? He schedules times for us to meet with him at 6 o'clock, and that's when all the graduate classes begin. There's no way you can meet him, okay? So I'm in this lecture, and I'm panicking because I have never had, if you want to come up here, that's this one right up here. If, if, you, um, if you ever experience, and I know many of you have, that class that's all lecture in a subject that you know nothing about, okay? And I was in panic mode. So what does an English teacher do when, when an English teacher's in panic mode? You, you read a book. <laughs> exactly. You head to the library, okay? I did. Boston University, this class was from 8 o'clock until 10.30 at night. Library at Boston University is open all night. So walk down there in snow because I'm going to find the books that are going to help me. Well, all those books had already been checked out. Uh, and so they weren't available. Uh, so I went to Barnes & Noble and what did I find? What's really popular? Dummies book to oh, statistics, yeah. okay? That was really helpful. But I always felt um, that I was having trouble in that class trying to catch up. We just did 
the lecture piece. He lectured and then you were supposed to figure it out when you got home and you had problems that would take me hours and hours and with a little baby and a little six-year-old and a little ten-year-old um, I was up most nights during that semester so that was very difficult for me. Um, so I went to Barnes & Noble, got my book and I muddled through and I remember getting a B plus in that class and I went to the professor and I said, don't laugh, Winifred knows this story. Um, I said, you gave me a B plus and I really think it should be B, a, a B or lower because I didn't learn that much. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Tricia, just take it and leave the classroom. <laughs> and I did, you know, and that's the last time I've ever reflected upon my grade and decided that maybe I don't have a B plus's worth of knowledge in my brain. And certainly, um, yeah, so that, that was uh, a rude awakening for me. And I had two more of these classes to go. So that being said, I want you to think about in a three minute buzz, and you are, placed, I tried to place you where you aren't with people in your content area as best as I could, uh, with the idea that you all have different learner profiles. And that is one of the elements of flexible grouping, grouping by learner profiles. And um, Rick Wormelli, which we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, he is the person who uh, thought in terms of learner profiles, in terms of group activity within the classroom because we all come with different curiosities and these learner profiles are actually more dispositions. This idea of learner, of curiosity, perseverance, and that we have students who have that, who have grit, uh, and others who do not. And that is also a way in order to support people within group activities. So I want you to take three minutes in among your group. I want you to think about your experiences in lecture classes. And then I want you to answer the question, how could the professor of this course have better supported learning in that particular classroom? So people like me walking off the street you know, barely getting through math in high school uh, has to do this course. So think for a minute and then start talking with your group. Let's put a few of these elements on the board. How could this professor had supported learning for people like me? Not the math person who's coming across the BU bridge from Harvard, and we had a couple of those, and they just walked right in and walked right out. It was very clear that he was teaching to those people who had knowledge. But I still have to get through three of these classes in order to get my dissertation, and I was going to do it no matter what. So supported learning. What, could, what can we suggest? Let's have a couple of points. Yes. Uh, relate the material to uh, to the students' lives a little bit, so you're not right. you don't have to just know math. Like a, a quick example, like when I'm going over cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. for policy analysis, I ask the older students in the room, especially graduate students, have you ever applied for a home loan? Mm -hmm. Like, well, this is the kind of cost-benefit analysis, it's risk analysis. Right. And then they understand what risk analysis is a little bit better because they've experienced it before, even if they didn't know it. Exactly, so. exactly, thank you. Who else has something you want to throw up on the board? Yes, Randy? Yeah, we, we didn't actually talk about this, but if I... <laughs> <laughs> if I okay, if I, collaboration, that's okay. Yeah. I think of my many lecture classes, I, I think the ones that really stay with me are the ones that had as much nonverbal communication as verbal. The mannerisms, the gestures, so how, how did that, how did you know, you could tell from your classroom whether they got it or not? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm talking about the professor. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in other words, uh, nonverbal cues are yeah. coming from you to offer them a safe space? Safe space, yeah. uh, bridges, between yeah. topics, Where? emphasis on, on uh, key points. Right. And it can flip flop the other way, where I can see a face and I know certain students who have faces when they don't understand. Or that 
and then look at the phone on their lap. And I know that I've lost them and I've got to start again on something else. What else can we put up here? Another couple of points. Mary? Um, my colleagues suggested that maybe work some of the problems in class. Okay, so problems in class. He might have helped us by showing us how to load SPSS. <laughs> that would have been very helpful. That a think, right, to do a think aloud. I'm going to add that, that think aloud. Because there's great value in you modeling and thinking through. Barbara? We again, as friends, that we didn't touch on this in our discussion. But um, I, I think, I was trying to think of the class where I felt the most lost ever. Mm -hmm. And it was actually my master's when I was doing. Uh, old and Middle English, and mm -hmm. I was a Middle English specialist, and they threw me in an Old English class because they said I needed more of it, but it was all these Old English people who knew what the hell they were doing. Mm -hmm. And I used to call it my weekly humiliation class, because mm -hmm. I'd walk in every Monday morning, she'd hand out a poem I didn't understand because in Old English, she'd say, who wants to start translating? Barbara? Oh. <laughs> right? And you know, you just melt, because I didn't, yeah. uh, you know. Sure. And what I'm thinking is, and it's hard in a large class, but mm -hmm. you need to know where your students are coming from. And she knew that I wasn't the old English specialist like the rest of the class was. So why are you starting with me when there's no one, when there's obvious that I'm not gonna know what I'm saying, I'm like, oh. Yes. Uh, and yeah. so if you know where your students are coming from as a professor, that can help you and, and not put someone on the spot. Absolutely. But it's hard in a big lecture class. I mean, yeah. this was a small yeah. discussion, master's level class, but it is hard. Awesome. I'm one thinking last one. About, uh, about a class that I had you know, difficulty with, and it was an art class. Oh. And yeah. I just can't, I just don't get it. So um, one of the things we had to do was a presentation. And I really worked hard on that because I had to work hard at something I could actually do. And she really complimented me on my job on the presentation, mm -hmm. which was nice. I thought because she couldn't compliment me on anything to do. <laughs> so, so, so she, it was she, nice. she had a positive point. Of she view. had a positive point okay. on when I did perform well. Yeah. So a positive attitude. Yeah. So I will tell you I made it through the course. Like I said, I got that B plus, but I had to do a lot. I had to go to the library. Couldn't find any books. I went to Barnes and Noble, found my books for dummies. I uh, also made friends with all those Harvard kids. And they didn't have kids, so I made everything, I did everything I could to be there at their study sessions at seven in the morning at Harvard, okay? And then I started connecting with other people that seemed to know what they were doing and making study groups. I had study groups up the gazoo. So I worked very, very hard to gain understanding. I went down to the, to the technology center to figure out how to load SPSS, it was that bad, uh, and, tr and work through, that's the program that we had to use and work through that. So that is how I got it through. But if some of those things had happened in that classroom, then I would have been able to relax. And we all know that when our students feel they're in a safe environment, that they're able to take the risks that they need to do and to ask the questions. I don't think I ever asked a question during that class the entire semester because I didn't want to appear to be tummy, <laughs> which is the name of the book that I used all the time. So that being said, I said, I'm going to do this. And I did it and I got through. Uh, and then the next class was on qualitative research and it was but then the last class was on the combination. But by then, I knew what I was doing in terms of quantitative data. So that being said, um, I made a choice. Time for dissertation, I made a choice. And what I decided to do was to learn more about collaboration. And so I mixed the two together, my two loves, philosophy and um, uh, teacher ed that idea of literature and teacher ed. So I mixed those two together, and I wrote about teacher understandings, although that wasn't the original title, but the president of the university, John Silber, read all of the titles. He didn't want a title that um, suggested psychology. So he changed my 
title around a little bit, uh, but it's all about collaboration in the classroom and how teacher beliefs and their philosophies impact how they teach in the classroom. So that's what my dissertation was about. And I found out a lot about uh, collaboration in the classroom, much more than I thought, which was putting groups together. But in actuality, there's much more to it. If you look at the materials from David and Roger Johnson, the Johnson brothers, although one recently died, I was so sad, I read about that in the newspaper, from University of Minneapolis in Minnesota, Minnesota, um, I've been watching the news coverage where everybody says, Minnesota, it's snowing so much. So uh, I uh, read a lot about collaboration in the classroom. And then Robert Slavin is another theorist. And of course, I, I went back to that idea of Vygotsky. Uh, and more recently, we've been looking in terms of uh, differentiating in the classroom. Uh, and in teacher ed, we've been talking about differentiating and how do we make sure that all uh, students learn um, uh, to their best capabilities. And I was involved in a workshop and a grant up in Massachusetts on differentiating in the classroom. And we went out and taught high school students uh, and um, how to work in small groups. And we worked with teachers on how to include differentiating in the curriculum. So that was my love. And so this is natural for me to talk about this idea of flexible grouping. So when we think of flexible grouping, we think about not one size fits all, because one size fits all fits no one. OK, you all, some of you um, have gotten a coat that says one size fits all, and the sleeves are down to here. The shawl wraps around you 20 times. The hat goes over your nose, uh, especially the ball caps, because you know who just won the Super Bowl, right? OK? And you know, Massachusetts, my husband wears something that has to do with the Red Sox or the Patriots every day of his life, even if it's a pin. Uh, but I just bought him for Valentine's Day a one-size-fits-all hat and took it out of the box, and it came down to here on me. So obviously, one size doesn't fit all. So my thinking is, and I've worked a lot with, with professor groups in previ my previous, uh, before Clayton State life, and there were some things that professors must reflect upon in their teaching. Uh, is whole group lecturing the only way to organize students for learning? Do I always teach this way? And if so, why? Because when we lecture, I'm not throwing it out, because there are times when we have to, we actually give uh, many lessons in teacher ed, that 20, 10 or 20 minute really focused direction um, that sets up the rest of the class. But there are times when you do lecture and students have to take notes. But there's also that moment where uh, <coughs> professors can stop and say, OK, get with your elbow partner and compare notes. Make sure you didn't miss anything. Make sure you didn't under there's something you didn't understand keeping double entry journals. There are so many ways in which you can promote that kind of collaboration with the students within the classroom. Uh, where is the le in the lesson could I create opportunities for students to work in small groups? Would this part of the lesson be more effective as an independent or small group activity? Uh, why do I have the whole class involved in this particular activity? Will I be able to meet the needs of all students with this kind of grouping? And I've been using a lot of whole class instruction lately, but what type of grouping can I use so that my students understand? And that's the whole point. You are differentiating what you do in your classroom so that when you meet people like me in your classroom and they are out there, they may not be telling you that they aren't, uh, that they understand, but they are out there. And you find that out when the first test comes, or the first independent writing, or the first, and then sometimes it's too late. I learned a lot about you. I was rotating. I was listening. And I learned a lot about how you need a safe classroom. Um, so I am listening to try to establish in my frame of reference what it is that my students need within the classroom so that they learn effectively. So uh, we can group in any number of ways, whoop, that didn't go. 
Okay, we can group in any number of ways, and this is what I want you to do now in your small group. Remember I said this was a conversation because I've got people in front of me who have been in the place I've been in and also be teaching and using some sort of collaborative learning within their classrooms. So, discuss how you have been successful in supporting group work. Let's have a conversation where we, before, we were saying, okay, this guy or this woman, and it was a guy uh, from Harvard, he needs to do this in order for people to understand, but what have you done? What can you share? And that's why I put you in the learner profile group, because you all have different experiences, because your content areas are different. So, three minute buzz. You've got three minutes. Well, let me ask you, we'll get a couple of, uh, we are tight on time, that's the 50 minute rule, so I've got to keep us rolling, but a uh, couple of ideas. How do you use, uh, how do you support group, uh, group work in your classroom? Okay, you build community, especially in the beginning. Okay, how else? Um, I want to give some uh, unsuccessful grouping. Um, I teach online classes, uh -huh. and I give group projects, mm -hmm. and I also give students the freedom to not to uh, work on the project in the group. They can work on the project independently, mm -hmm. and 99% of my students, they choose to work independently, not yeah. in the group. So they do choose to do it independently, independently. rather than a group. I prefer yeah. them to do it yeah. in a group, but yeah. they don't. But they choose. They, they, yeah. Right, that's their choice. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is the case? <laughs> they are decent learners. So uh, they live in different on. places. It's mm -hmm. hard to communicate and meet, like virtually. Okay, so where they live. Like yeah. they live yeah. all it's, all, it's all online, so they yeah. can't um, like meet. Or they can't they, meet, even they, though they could meet online. But they also work full time. Okay, so it's it's a time factor for them. Yeah. So okay, what else? Yes, Mary. I teach multicultural education, mm -hmm. so I have students. We tackle a lot of tough topics, and students have fixed opinions about these topics. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that we do group work is I will find the various positions on a topic, and I'll put signs around the room, and students will have to go stand under mm -hmm. wherever their opinion is. But then at that point in time, they also have to send scouts out to other groups to listen to the other group's perspective uh -huh. and then bring the information back to their uh -huh. group. Uh -huh. So, in other words, a, an opinion challenger. Okay. What else, Winifred? Yeah. Um, one of my classes, uh, toward the beginning of that class, I have students uh, sit, sit in their content areas, mm -hmm. especially for middle class, where you have math, English social studies and what was the other one? Science. Science. <laughs> so uh, make them um, discuss and convince, present and convince everybody else why their subject area is most important and why, <laughs> and why, students, and why the students they are going to teach should listen to them. You have to convince them that it's important and why yours is more important than everybody else. And they enjoy struggling and sometimes that's the first time they're thinking of why am I teaching this? Why, why, sure. should, why should students sure. learn it? Yeah, okay, one more, and then we'll move on. We're tight on time, I'm moving us through. I only have a few more slides to go, but one more, give me one more, yes. My class in our group communication unit in public speaking, mm -hmm. I have them work in groups to talk about why they don't want to work in groups. <laughs> <laughs> because even online, I'll start the unit by saying who likes working in groups, and everybody hates it, and so I, we write on the board the top 20, 25 reasons why people hate working in groups. Mm -hmm. And it's always the same. Yeah. But then I show and what, what are some of those reasons? Uh, because lazy people, um, dominating people. Uh, those are always the two biggest ones. Can't get in touch with people. Um, things like that are usually the big, the big items. The big items. And yeah. um, that is one element of this idea of flexible grouping is that you need to teach everyone in the class how to be a good, good group member and the responsibilities. In fact, there was something on Facebook the other day and it says, why I don't want to work in a group? Lazy guy, someone in the ear, and he's you know singing songs all the time and not focusing. And then the one studious guy is the one who does all the work. Uh, and so I thought that was really, really an interesting element. Okay, so uh, again, I was into collaboration. Let's just throw people together. Uh, let's figure it out. But 
since I've been here at Clayton State, I've noticed that people form friendships and they do not want to change their chairs. They do not want to move. And I've had students, when I say, okay, I want to change people up a little bit, you can see the eyes roll. And of course, I give reasons why I'm changing people up so that they get to hear other people's points of view. That's not quite true. What it is, is I read all your papers, your 100 first year writing papers or your tests or whatever, and what I've learned is that I've got really strong students, okay, who are more than ready to um, have that experience of working in groups. I have the students who uh, are only interested in certain things, and I have other students who don't fit learning profiles. I might have a table of really, really straight A's. I'm taking 85,000 notes here, but I may have another group, and you know, you know this group, phones down here, and when Dr. Smith is talking to this group, there goes the phone up, or the, you know, gently placed earbud that, you know, the hair goes down over, and, or the hat goes down over, and you know. So there are lots of challenges to group work, and so I, um, when I started looking into different ways, I saw that model. You know, I've done differentiating for a long time, but I never thought in terms of flexible grouping until I saw a video by Carol Ann Tomlinson, and I read her book on differentiated instruction in the mixed ability classroom. And that's what we have here, is that mixed ability classroom uh, in uh, a pretty much across the board. Uh, and so I started to think in terms of how do I change my groups up? And I got wedded into this idea of flexible grouping. So we have just enough time to finish this up. So it's a major point of differentiating in the classroom. Uh, and while high schools differentiate, middle grades differentiate, uh, elementary schools differentiate, meaning this uh, providing different avenues to acquiring content, to processing or making sense of ideas, and to developing products so that each student can learn effectively, um, you are, I'm seeing more and more that it's going into the college classroom that we have to make sure that when our students leave here, especially with G2C, the gateways to completion, of which I'm on that committee, we're looking at first year writing and ways that we can uh, build um, uh, student um, retention. Uh, and we ha do have 96% retention rate from uh, this first semester to the second semester in first year writing, so I'm gonna throw that one in. This idea that we need to make sure that we differentiate within our classrooms so that everybody uh, can be involved in, in uh, making sure that everybody stays within the college system and graduates. We work closely with the writing studios. We now have these PAMs coming into the classroom. There are student assistants who are right there by my side, like teaching fellows, working with my students. And so we do everything that we can um, uh, to uh, afford um, opportunity for all students. But grouping is really important. This idea of flexible grouping is the best way that groups can become part of a dynamic and changing process. Because I found that when I say, to this table, you all are by learning profile, but let's say you were all one content. Well, you all do sort of the same thing in that one content. So if I have a group of four students who have been friends now, they've sat with each other for six weeks, they don't want to leave their chair, but they're going to say the same thing when we do peer review. They're going to say, oh, this paper is really good. You only have some grammar issues, and not look at it from another lens. And so by breaking people up, uh, in flexible grouping, and we're going to talk in a few minutes about the three different types of flexible grouping, but we don't want those students to be stuck. If I had this group work for the rest of the semester together, you'd know each other so well that it's a nice, safe place, but maybe you might not challenge someone else because you know that person uh, has had a toothache for three weeks. You, know, you see what I'm saying? That you need to, to uh, switch things up. Uh, flexibility groupings also allow for equity within the classroom because everyone, learning becomes a shared responsibility within the classroom and with an equitable opportunity for all. So there is this idea that we are working together 
that we want everyone to be successful. Doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, whether you've taken writing before and you flunked it and you're now in the course again. Uh, it, that doesn't matter. What matters is are you getting the rich experience that you need and are you helping your classmates? And I say in my freshman writing classes, in my, my um, strategy classes, that we are here to help everyone be successful. There's no space for competition in my class. It's, oh, you got a B, because we've all seen those students. I've seen those. Yeah, I got an A. Um, how, come, how come you didn't get an A? Or someone will say, well, I got a B plus. Let me see your paper to see why I didn't get the A. But that's not the point. The point is, did you gain the understanding that you need to be successful? And everyone has to do that. Uh, also allows professors to focus on smaller and more manageable pieces of teaching. I could sit down at each one of these tables for two minutes and listen to what you had to say. I'm going to give you some sort of direction, like I've given you a question that you all were to uh, answer individually and then in your groups. So we have this kind of um, thing going on of always looking in terms of putting things in smaller, more manageable groups uh, and more manageable tasks. And by working with groups individually, I get a really good bird's eye view of who's saying what and who's understanding. So I can take my little, and Rick Wormelli in his videos, we share a lot of these videos, teaching videos, he has a middle school class in Herndon. Well, groups relate all the way through the adult um, uh, area. And so I take little notes so that if I'm hearing questions, I might stop and say, okay, let's, let's see if we have an answer to that question, or we'll present it in, in whole class discussion. And then this idea that it promotes ongoing formative assessment. I'm always checking, are the objectives being met? Are people understanding? Do people walking out here know what the task is? I can't tell you, even my family says this to me, do you have to say everything in three different ways? <laughs> yes, I do, because I say it in three different ways in my classroom so that everyone understands. So the bottom line, and I've got five minutes and I think I can do this, yes. Bottom line is that flexible grouping is a central part of respect for all learners, honoring individual differences, teaching for success, and collaborating in a differentiated classroom. And that's from Carol Ann Tomlinson. This idea of teaching for success to me is absolutely everything so that people are successful. So there are three ways you can group. And of course, you can make your own. It's like we English folk, we make new words, and then we tell everyone, well, it's going to be in the dictionary soon, right? <laughs> I make up words all the time. And people, my husband will say to me, that's not a word. And I say, it's going to be one, because I'm starting a trend here. Uh, we group by readiness. Readiness refers to how ready students are for, the more, for, more, uh, for more complexity in their lessons. Okay? I uh, saw our video once of a classroom where we have students who are not quite ready to handle poetry and other students who write poetry. We've got those students. I've got those students already in my um, freshman writing courses, those who love poetry. Well, you know what? They're not quite ready over here. So let's give them a poem that's very literal so that they can look at the structure and look at the language. But let's give this group who writes poetry uh, more abstract words, metaphors. Uh, Anne Bradstreet. I give a poem to Anne Bradstreet. To this group, they understand it. To this group, their response is, well, I think she loves her husband. OK, <laughs> Anne Bradstreet, the Puritan. But this group is breaking it down. Uh, you know, and sometimes I'll go into the Move On When Ready classes, and lo and behold, they can do rhyme and meter, and I'm just blown away from it. So we, we look in terms of readiness. Uh, and we change the nature of the task for individual people, not the end result, only the task at hand for understanding. And then we can do those think alouds, where we put that poem right on top of um, the uh, Elmo, the overhead, and we have them talk their way through their understanding of what it is that they've just learned um, from the group, and it's that group interaction. So the last two areas are 
grouping by interest, okay? We all have an interest. Uh, I once had a group of students who all had, it was my first year here, they had all had babies. Amy, you weren't here yet, but it seemed like we had four babies right before the semester um, came. So they were sharing books on babies and they connected with one another. And they um, began to see that, wow, first baby, that means that I'm now responsible for the care and feeding and education of this child, and it changed their views on life. And so their interests together helps them. Also the interest in the subject, just like with this other group for readiness. They loved poetry, they wrote poetry. Uh, and so I could have grouped them by interest. Um, Rick Wormelli in his video grouped them by uh, uh, readiness, but it could have been from in for interest as well. And then learner profile, different from learning profiles, which is the sociology, psychologically balanced, um, terminology that's uh, well structured. This is a learner profile of how, what your dispositions are in your particular classroom. I can guarantee you that when I went to the classroom at Boston University, and I've got two minutes left, <laughs> at Boston University uh, in that statistics class that I was having, I'm prone to panic attacks. I had maybe a couple before this. Uh, because I think it helps me, grounds me, those pants. You know, because you're right across the hall from me. But I think it grounds me, that idea that um, you have to find your safety net. You have to find it. And we as professors have to allow that. It is ultimately the student's responsibility to do what he or she has to do to get the job done. I have a sign. Not quite yet, I have a, a, it is what it is sign, but I'm getting a just do your job sign in my office and I'm gonna point to it, just do your job. <laughs> when you come to my class and say, well, I didn't understand the assignment, well, how can that be? I'm sitting here in my office just waiting for you to come by. When my phone bings, I'm so curious that I'm gonna click it to see who it is and you're gonna get a response from me within 10 minutes, right, Amy? Yep, within 10 minutes. <laughs> Uh, I'm there for you, and so I'm going to make sure that everything in, um, in every possibility uh, I'm going to do to make it successful for you. I also have three, uh, I'm just going to point these out, but these are three common um, ways that you can group flexibly, flexibly, think, pair, share, that's what you did today, you thought. You paired up, of course you were in groups, but you could pair up with your elbow partner and then share with the full class. Uh, and this is in your PowerPoint. And this idea of jigsaw, I use this in advanced grammar or I use this in my freshman writing class where I have students, we're looking at the whole chapter on commas. And this table is in charge of uh, the first part, you know, sections one, two, and three, your three, four, and five, five, six, and seven, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and there's five per group. And then I'm going to have you, I'm going to break you up, and you're going to be the expert that's going to tell them what it is that you learned. Uh, and I always say, what did you already know and what didn't you know that you can share with the rest of us? And the last one that I use all the time uh, is, this idea, whoop, this idea of elbow partners. Just share, just turn to the person next to you. And the good thing is that your elbow partner isn't going to be your elbow partner the next class. So that you're always exchanging ideas. And it also, um, you know, this is a responsibility for our students too, because there's a lot of peer pressure. If you come to the table and you haven't done your work, uh, and there's a lot of peer pressure there, uh, particularly in a class where there is that exchange of ideas all the time. So, any questions before you leave? That's my spiel. Something that I know and love. Yes? So when you're working by readiness, how do you do that in a way that does not draw attention to people at higher levels of functioning? Well, they that don't happens? know. Okay, they don't know because the next group I may group by readiness, but it's another different kind of task. So your readiness, my readiness when I was in college in my first poetry class was pretty low. 
But as time went by, I moved groups around. And I mean, I was in different kinds of groups so that the readiness changes. So they're never the same group, hardly ever. And we do have a lot of students with disabilities, but at any given time, that student knows something that somebody else doesn't know. And I have to be, you have to be ultimately really aware of your students. So, what else? Yes? How do you prevent social loafing during mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lot of group work, mm -hmm. um, whether it is assigning participation grades mm -hmm. to a certain degree? How do you help reduce that, prevent that? It's all about the tasks so that I have tasks. So if four is in a group, I like three or five because if you've got, if you're working with argumentation, you've always got one person who breaks the tie. So what I have is I'll have tasks that they have to complete. And we're only talking about 10 minutes. Sure. So you're an A, you're a B, you're a C. So each one of you has a task that you need to complete and think about and bring evidence to in the text, and then you discuss it. So everybody has something that has to be done. There's nobody that's hiding, unless they go off to the bathroom, and that does happen, uh, <laughs> with the phone um, you know, in the corner. What else? What other questions do you have before I let you go back to your classes? Thank you. Thank you. This has been a privilege, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Ah, flowers. Oh, oh, thank you. I love flowers. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.